Hello everyone! Welcome back to Jacoby's Library. This is the series where we've been reading through all the books I've collected so far in my Vanilla Skyrim Let's Play, The Adventures of Jacoby. Be sure to check that out. Today's book is called The Great War. I know on screen the title is much longer than that, but the book when you pick it up is called The Great War. And it is quite literally a very detailed account of the Great War between the Old Mary Dominion and the Empire finally ending in the signing of the White Gold Concordant. This story gives a lot of background information onto the current events in Skyrim. It covers the desolation achieved during the Oblivion Crisis and everything leading up to pretty close to current game time within Skyrim. So I think it's really cool to uh, check out this lore. So without further ado, The Great War. A concise account of the Great War between the Empire and the Aldmeri Dominion. Author's note, much of what is written in this book is pieced together from documents captured from the enemy during the war, interrogation of prisoners, and eyewitness accounts from surviving soldiers and Imperial officers. I myself commanded the 10th Legion in Hammerfell and Cyrodiil until I was wounded in 175 during the assault of the Imperial City. That said, the full truth of some events may never be known. I have done my best to fill in the gaps with educated conjectures based on my experience as well as my hard-earned knowledge of the enemy. The Rise of the Thalmor Although it is not well known, Somerset Isle suffered from the Oblivion Crisis as much as Cyrodiil did. The elves made war upon the Oblivion invaders, occasionally even crossing over to close down Oblivion gates. As a nation, they had more success than Cyrodiil did, although the limitless Daedric hordes made the outcome a foregone conclusion. The Thalmor had always been a powerful faction within Somerset Isle, but had also always been a minority voice. During the crisis, the Crystal Tower was forced to give the Thalmor greater power and authority. Their efforts almost certainly saved Somerset Isle from being overrun. They capitalized on their success to seize total control in the Fourth Era year 22. They renamed the nation Alinor, which harkens back to an earlier age before the ascendancy of man. Most people outside of the Old Mary Dominion still call it Somerset Isle, either out of peevishness or ignorance. In the fourth era year 29, the government of Valenwood was overthrown by Thalmor collaborators and a union with Alinor proclaimed. It appears that Thalmor agents had formed close ties to certain Bosmeri factions even before the Oblivion Crisis. The Empire and its Bosmer allies, caught completely off guard, were quickly defeated by the much better prepared Altmer forces that invaded Valenwood on the heels of the coup. Thus was the Aldmeri Dominion reborn. Shortly afterward, the Aldmeri Dominion severed all contact with the Empire. For 70 years they were silent. Most scholars believe there was some sort of internal strife in Alinor, but very little is known of the factional struggles that went on inside the Dominion while the Thalmor consolidated its power in Somerset and Valenwood. In the Fourth Era, year 98, the two moons, Masser and Secunda, vanished. Within most of the Empire, this was viewed with trepidation and fear, and elsewhere, it was far worse. Culturally, the moons are much more influential to the Khajiit, after two years of the Void Knights, the Moons returned. The Thalmor announced that they had restored the Moons using previously unknown Dawn Magics, but it is unclear if they truly restored the Moons or just took advantage of foreknowledge that they would return. Regardless of the truth of the matter, the Khajiit credited the Thalmor as their saviors. Within 15 years, Imperial influence and elsewhere had so diminished that the Empire was unable to respond effectively to the coup of Fourth Era Year 115, which dissolved the Elsewhere Confederacy and recreated the ancient kingdoms of Anaquina and Palatine as client states of the Aldmeri Dominion. Once more, the Empire failed to stop the advance of Thalmor power. When Titus Mede II ascended the throne in Fourth Era Year 168, he inherited a weakened Empire, the glory days of the Septums were a distant memory. Valenwood and elsewhere were gone, ceded to the Thalmor enemy. Black Marsh had been lost to Imperial rule since the aftermath of the Oblivion Crisis. Morrowind had never recovered fully from the eruption of Mount Vardenfell. 
Hammerfell was plagued by infighting between crowns and forebears. Only High Rock, Cyrodiil, and Skyrim remained prosperous and peaceful. Emperor Titus Mede had only a few short years to consolidate his rule before his leadership was put to the ultimate test. The war begins. On the 30th of Frostfall, First Era, year 171, the Aldmeri Dominion sent an ambassador to the Imperial City with a gift and a covered cart and an ultimatum for the new emperor. The long list of demands included staggering tributes, disbandment of the blades, outlawing the worship of Talos, and ceding large sections of Hammerfell to the Dominion. Despite the warnings of his generals of the Empire's military weakness, Emperor Titus Mede II rejected the ultimatum. The Thalmor ambassador upended the cart, spilling over a hundred heads on the floor, every blade's agent in Somerset and Valenwood. And so began the Great War which would consume the Empire and the Aldmeri Dominion for the next five years. Within days, Aldmeri armies invaded Hammerfell and Cyrodiil simultaneously. A strong force commanded by the Thalmor general, Lord Nerefin, attacked Cyrodiil from the south, marching out of hidden camps in northern elsewhere and flanking the Imperial defenses along the Valenwood border. Leowin soon fell to the invaders, while Breville was cut off and besieged. At the same time, an Aldmeri army under Lady Aranelia crossed into western Cyrodiil from Valenwood, bypassing Anvil and Kvach and crossing into Hammerfell. Smaller Aldmeri forces landed along the southern coastline of Hammerfell. The disunited Red Guard forces offered only scattered resistance to the invaders, and much of the southern coastline was quickly overrun. The greatly outnumbered Imperial legions retreated across the Alakir Desert in the now famous March of Thirst. Fourth Era, Year 172 through 173, the Aldmeri advance into Cyrodiil. It appears now that the initial Aldmeri objective was in fact the conquest of Hammerfell, and that the invasion of Cyrodiil was intended only to pin down the Imperial legions while Hammerfell was overrun. However, the surprising initial success of Lord Nerefin's attack led the Thalmor to believe that the Empire was weaker than they had thought. The capture of the Imperial City itself and the complete overthrow of the Empire thus became their primary objective of the next two years. As we know, the Thalmor nearly achieved their objective. It was only because of the Emperor's determined leadership during the Empire's darkest hour that this disaster was averted. During Fourth Era, Year 172, the Aldmeri advanced deeper into Cyrodiil. Breville and Anvil both fell to the invaders. By the end of the year, Lord Nerefin had advanced to the very walls of the Imperial City. There were fierce naval clashes in Lake Rumer and along the Nibbin, as the Imperial forces attempted to hold the eastern bank. In Hammerfell, the Thalmor were content to consolidate their gains as they took control of the whole southern coastline which was in fact their stated objective in the ultimatum delivered to the Emperor. Of the southern cities, only Hegeth still held out. The survivors of the March of Thirst regrouped in northern Hammerfell, joined by reinforcements from High Rock. The year 4th Era 173 saw stiffening Imperial resistance in Cyrodiil, but the seemingly inexorable Aldmeri advance continued. Fresh legions from Skyrim bolstered the Emperor's main army in the Imperial City, and the Aldmeri forced the crossing of the Nibbin and began advancing in force up the eastern bank. By the end of the year, the Imperial City was surrounded on three sides. Only the northern supply route to Bruma remained open. In Hammerfell, Imperial fortunes took a turn for the better. In early 4th Era 173, a forebear armor from Sentinel broke the siege of Haggath, a crown city, leading to the reconciliation of the two factions. Despite this, Lady Aranelia's main army succeeded in crossing the Alakir Desert. The Imperial legions under General Decianus met them outside Skaven in a bloody and indecisive clash. Decianus withdrew and left Aranelia in possession of Skaven, but the Aldmeri were too weakened to continue their advance. Fourth Era 174, the sack of the Imperial City. In 4th era, year 174, the Thalmor leadership committed all available forces to the campaign in Cyrodiil, gambling on a decisive victory to end the war once and for all. During the spring, 
Aldmeri reinforcements gathered in southern Cyrodiil, and on 12th the Second Seed, they launched a massive assault on the Imperial City itself. One army drove north to completely surround the city, while Lord Nerefin's main force attacked the walls from the south, east, and west. The Emperor's decision to fight his way out of the city rather than make a last stand was a bold one. No general dared advise him to abandon the capital, but Titus II was proven right in the end. While the 8th Legion fought a desperate and doomed rearguard action on the walls of the city, Titus II broke out of the city to the north with his main army, smashing through the surrounding Aldmeri forces and linking up with reinforcements marching south from Skyrim under General Janna. Meanwhile, however, the capital fell to the invaders and the infamous sack of the Imperial City began. The Imperial Palace was burned, the White Gold Tower itself looted, and all manner of atrocities carried out by the vengeful elves on the innocent populace. In Hammerfell, General Decianus was preparing to drive the Old Mary back from Skaven when he was ordered to march for Cyrodiil. Unwilling to abandon Hammerfell completely, he allowed a great number of invalids to be discharged from the legions before they marched east. These veterans formed the core of the army that eventually drove Lady Aranelia's forces back across the Alakir, late in year 174, taking heavy losses on their retreat from harassing attacks by the Alakir warriors. Fourth Era, year 175, the Battle of the Red King. Fourth Era, year 175, the Battle of the Red Ring. During the winter of 4th Era 174 to 175, the Thalmor seemed to have believed that the war in Cyrodiil was all but over. They made several attempts to negotiate with Titus II. The Emperor encouraged them in their belief that he was preparing to surrender. Meanwhile, he gathered his forces to retake the Imperial City. In what is now known as the Battle of the Red Ring, a battle that will serve as a model for Imperial strategists for generations to come, Titus II divided his forces into three. One army, with the legions from Hammerfell under General Decianus, was hidden in the Colovian Highlands near Coral. The Old Mary were unaware that he was no longer in Hammerfell, possibly because the Imperial veterans Decianus had left behind led Lady Aranelia to believe that she still faced an Imperial army. The second army, largely of Nord legions under General Janna, took up position near Chayton Hall. The main army was commanded by the Emperor himself, and would undertake the main assault of the Imperial City from the north. On the 30th of Rain's Hand, the bloody battle of the Red Ring began as General Decianus swept down on the city from the west, while General Janna's legionnaires drove south along the Red Ring Road. In a two-day assault, Janna's army crossed the Nibbin and advanced west, attempting to link up with Decianus' legions and thus surround the Imperial City. Lord Nerefin was taken by surprise by Decianus' assault, but Janna's troops faced bitter resistance as the Aldmeri counterattacked from Breville and Skingrad. The heroic Nord legionnaires held firm, however, beating off the piecemeal Aldmeri attacks. By the fifth day of the battle, the Aldmeri army in the Imperial City was surrounded. Titus II led the assault from the north, personally capturing Lord Nerefin. It is rumored the Emperor wielded the famed sword Goldbrand, although this has never been officially confirmed by the Imperial government. An attempt by the Old Mary to break out of the city to the south was blocked by the unbreakable shield wall of General Janna's battered legions. In the end, the main Old Mary army in Cyrodiil was completely destroyed. The Emperor's decision to withdraw from the Imperial City in 4th Era 174 was bloodily vindicated. Lord Nerefin was kept alive for 33 days, hanging from the White Gold Tower. It is not recorded where his body was buried, if it was buried at all. One source claims he was carried off by a winged Daedra on the 34th day. The White Gold Concordat and the End of the War Although victorious, the Imperial armies were in no shape to continue the war. The entire remaining Imperial force was gathered in Cyrodiil, exhausted and decimated by the Battle of the Red Ring. Not a single legion had more than half its soldiers fit for duty. Two legions had been effectively annihilated, not counting the loss of the Eighth during the retreat from the Imperial City the previous year. 
Titus II knew that there would be no better time to negotiate peace, and late in the Fourth Era 175, the Empire and the Aldmeri Dominion signed the White Gold Concordat, ending the Great War. The terms were harsh, but Titus II believed that it was necessary to secure peace and give the Empire a chance to regain its strength. The two most controversial terms of the Concordat were the banning of the worship of Talos and the cession of a large section of southern Hammerfell, most of what was already occupied by Aldmeri forces. Critics have pointed out that the Concordat is almost identical to the ultimatum the Emperor rejected five years earlier. However, there is a great difference between agreeing to such terms under the mere threat of war and agreeing to them at the end of a long and destructive war. No part of the Empire would have accepted these terms in 4th Era 171, dictated by the Thalmor at Sword's Point. Titus II would have faced civil war. By 4th Era 175, most of the Empire welcomed peace at almost any price. Epilogue, Hammerfell fights on alone. Hammerfell, however, refused to accept the White Gold Concordat, being unwilling to concede defeat and the loss of so much of their territory. Titus II was forced to officially renounce Hammerfell as an imperial province in order to preserve the hard-won peace treaty. The Red Guards, understandably, looked on this as a betrayal. In this, the Thalmor certainly achieved one of their long-term goals by sowing lasting bitterness between Hammerfell and the Empire. In the end, the heroic Red Guards fought the Aldmeri Dominion to a standstill, although the war lasted for five more years and left southern Hammerfell devastated. The Red Guards say that this proves that the White Gold Concordat was unnecessary, and that if Titus II had kept his nerve, the Aldmeri could have been truly defeated by the combined forces of Hammerfell and the rest of the Empire. The truth of that assertion can, of course, never be known, but the Red Guards should not forget the great sacrifice of Imperial blood. Breton, Nord, and Cyrodiilic at the Battle of the Red Ring that weakened the Dominion enough to allow the eventual Second Treaty of Strauss Mackay in 4th Era 180 and the withdrawal of Aldmeri forces from Hammerfell. There can be no doubt that the current peace cannot last forever. The Thalmor take the long view, as is proved by the sequence of events leading up to the Great War. All those who value freedom over tyranny can only hope that before it is too late, Hammerfell and the Empire will be reconciled and stand united against the Thalmor threat. Otherwise, any hope to stem the tide of Thalmor rule over all of Tamriel is dimmed.